So uh, as you can see from the title of my talk, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about work that we have done over the past uh, years in my lab to prove that actin and actin-associated proteins are important key regulators of uh, gene expression at multiple levels, uh, both at the transcriptional and post-transcriptional level, in fact. And I hope I will convince you at the end of this talk that actin is actually a, a key protein in the cell nucleus for nuclear function. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, so I, I mean, I, I think we all know here that actin has been discovered more than a hundred years ago. It was discovered originally by the, uh, the by the cell, by, by, the, by the German cell biologist Willy Kuhner uh, way back in the 1860s, and then rediscovered at the, in, around the, at the beginning of the 1940s as individual proteins. And then since then, there has been a boost of papers or studies which have basically dissected how they cooperate, they synergize for, um, molecular, uh, as molecular motors, in, mostly for cytoplasmic functions. The first kind of shy reports addressing that actin is also a nuclear protein, an abundant nuclear protein popped up in the literature in the middle of the 1970s. And then I always like to point out that there were two milestone studies in 84 by two major labs, the laboratory of Brigitte Jokusch in Braunschweig, and uh, Pierre Chambon in, in, in Strasbourg actually demonstrated that actin, confirmed that actin is a, an abundant nuclear protein, but it's also important for gene regulation, for gene transcription, actually. They provided circumstantial evidence. These papers were kept aside, were left aside for many years. Uh, in fact, a long period of time had to elapse before another important, con I, I'm, I'm talking about the cell paper in an Embo journal, so, I mean, it's not as if... So as I said, uh, an, a long period of time had to elapse again before a major contribution popped up again by the laboratory of Gerald Crabtree in, in the United States, a cell paper, and they actually showed evidence for the first time that actin is a, 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 a component of chromatin remodeling complexes, at least certain chromatin remodeling complexes which are ATP dependent. And then almost simultaneously, the, the first form of myosin 1 was discovered, the first form of myosin was discovered in the cell nucleus, what we refer to as nuclear myosin 1, NM1 for short, and we discovered that actin is in RMP particles, with nascent and, and mature RMP particles. And since then, and, and a few years after, a number of lab, uh, my lab and a number of other labs demonstrated that actin actually associate, associates with all three eukaryotic RNA polymerases, and it's required for gene transcription. And nowadays, people started to discuss about the polymerization state of nuclear actin, what happens, whether it's monomeric, polymeric, or whether, whether it in fact, synergizes with different form, forms of myosin for as molecular motors, right? And we don't know yet what, uh, what, whether this is the case. So, uh, um, so, so we found, actually, we discovered that actin is in, in, in RMP particles using this uh, uh, kind of strange, well, not strange, actually, it's a very interesting model system. It's an insect, as you can see, it's called Chironomus tentans, and uh, it's not too far away from the Anopheles mosquito, it's, but it's a non-biting midge. You at, at, at the larval stage, it has got very large salivary glands and, uh, and from which you can isolate four polyten chromosomes in a really nice and non-disruptive manner, which means that they retain their morphology and they also, they're also transcriptionally active. So that's ideal to do immunohistochemistry. So then we raised the an antibody against actin that cross-reacts, as you can see, with the chironomus uh, uh, actin, both in the cytoplasm and in the nucleus. And we use this material to, immuno, to perform immuno, immunohistochemistry on the isolated polyten chromosomes. You can see that when we did that, we got a discrete pattern, which is reminiscent of transcription sites on all four chromosomes. Two and three are not shown here, of course. Also on chromosome four, where you uh, highlight here, highlighted the, the exceptionally large Balbiani rings, which are a peculiarity of this chromosome. And, but the amazing thing at that time that left us kind of... Uh, uh, was that if you treat with RNAs, pre-treat with RNAs, these isolated chromosomes, and then perform the immunohistochemistry, then you, you lose actin staining. And this is symptomatic of the fact that actin is likely to be associated with these chromosome, chromosomes in an RNA-dependent manner. And in fact, uh, we concluded from this initial study that actin is loaded in the nascent RMP, right, which is still associated with the chromatin axis. Now, in, in this uh, study, which, as you can see, we published a few years ago already, we did also cryo-electron microscopy. I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, the, the beauty of this system is that it allowed us uh, to uh, establish that actin is not only present in the, pre, uh, in the nascent RMP, therefore in pre-MRMPs, 
still, as I said, associated with the chromatin axis, but it remains uh, as, a, as a genuine component of mature RMPs, follows the RMP through the passages through the nuclear pore complex all the way to the tubular structures of the endoplasmic reticulum. And then, I mean, so, so of course then you realize that this puts a strong bias on the po possible roles, role, roles uh, of actin along the entire gene expression pathway at the very beginning during uh, RMP elongation, maturation of the RMP, targeting of the RNA all the way on the, on the cytoskeletal structures. And in fact, uh, so when I started setting up my lab, I was very interested in, in this aspect, which is the uh, elongation of the RMP, co-transcription elongation of the RMP. And in the RMP assembly slash configuration, I didn't put here configuration, but that's actually what I am, uh, we are after. So during the talk, I'm going to tell you a bit of, I'm going to show you a bit of data showing that uh, really this, uh, what we have done to prove how acting, to test how acting functions in RMP elongation in this context as well. And at the end of the talk, the last 10 minutes, uh, uh, I will show you a, bit, a, li a little bit more on ribosomal RNA biogenesis and how acting cooperates with uh, nuclear myosin 1. Okay, RMP elongation. Now, uh, of course, I'm a biochemist and I was interested in, uh, in, in looking for, uh, for actin-associated H and RMP proteins, which are components of the RMP, right? So here, basically. And, uh, so, and to cut a long story short, we discovered in the Chironomos Tentens model system that a, a protein that is called HLP652, and this protein, just to put it into context, is, is actually very conserved in, in mammals. It's, uh, it's, it's similar to the transcriptional coactivator PSF, uh, P55, P P54 NRB or non O in, in Drosophila, and there are two R RNA binding domains, but there is a very peculiar C terminal domain here. And here we found that there is an, an novel actin binding motif, which is shown here. And these two residues are essential for actin binding. If you mutate them to arginines, you basically abolish actin binding. So, um, so what, what, why do we have this interaction, this tight interaction? Now, to uh, basically, we set up an assay um, what, in chironomous tentons. So what, what we did was to uh, inject competing peptides that we know disrupt the actin H and HLP65 interaction in vivo. And, uh, and then we performed uh, uh, basically a run-on assay by following the RUTP incorporation, UTP analog. And then we evaluated transcription by mon monitoring the incorporated BRUTP in, transcri in transcription sites. And, uh, and, um, yeah. and what happens here is, is quite, uh, at, at that time was also quite extraordinary because if you inject uh, the competing peptides that bind actin and disrupts uh, the interaction between actin and HLP652, basically you abolish incorporation of BRUTP, an effect that is similar to uh, what happens when you treat with actinomycin D, and, uh, and not, of course, with control injections. This is our uninjected cell. So get, this is also an advantage of the chironomous tendons model system. You have these huge cells, right, where you can, uh, and the nuclei are especially big, so you can very easily inject uh, material in there. Now, is this uh, a peculiarity of an insect? Uh, so it is not. This is a pretty stable, a pretty, pretty conserved mechanism because a few years ago we discovered that in mammals actin interacts with a protein called HNRMPU and a close look at the C-terminus of this protein showed uh, that it contains a, a motif that is extremely conserved uh, in comparison to the chironomous protein. And in fact, uh, if you abolish, uh, if you mutate this arginine and lysine to alanines, you abolish actin binding. And again, we set up uh, the same experiments uh, here. Uh, we injected uh, competing peptides, and then we found that in, nucle in the nucleus of HeLa cells, and then we found that, again, you b basically abolish BRUTP incorporation to nation transcripts. Now, in this study, we also showed for the first time that actin and HNRMPU are also associated with the hyperphosphorylated form of the RNA polymerase 2. Now, taken all together, together with uh, Neus Visa, uh, we pr proposed a model a few years ago where we suggested that act uh, actin is, uh, is actually loaded on the nascent RMP, presumably via interactions with uh, HNRMPs, and perhaps there is an intermediate step that goes through the phosphorylated uh, CTD of the RNA polymerase 2. In, in, in any case, we suggested that there are adapter proteins that bind to actin directly and facilitate recruitment of coactivators, transcriptional coactivators, for instance, histone acetyltransferases. Now, this model uh, turned out to be correct because in the chironomous tentons, uh, we found that there is a peculiar histone acetyltransferase, which is called P2D10, 
And uh, in, in, uh, in mammals, we found that uh, actin and HNRMP you cooperate to recruit uh, the histone acetyltransferase PCAF. And I'm going to show you a couple of experiments here because, anyway, it's published. So, um, consistent with this hypothesis, uh, uh, we found that uh, we, when we did uh, chromatin immunoprecipitations, we found uh, using several. Uh, uh, constitutively expressed genes like beta tubulin, S19, the ribosomal protein, GAPDH, and so forth, we found that actin, uh, um, well, actin HNRMPU, and CDFA, uh, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and then PCAF, uh, occupancy correlate with, uh, o with occupancy of the polymerase. They are sitting both a promoter and coding region. Now, in this study, what is also interesting is that we raised a peptide-specific antibody that we called SED17 again, against the actin binding site on HNRMPU, and this antibody precipitates only the promoter. This was important because it allowed us to map the topology of this complex at the gene. But anyway, if we perform then chromatin immunoprecipitation in the presence of TSA, which is trichostatin A, of course, the, the, the inhibitor of the histone deacetylases, what happens is that the gene is devoid of these three proteins, right? Indicative of, indicative of the fact that somehow their occupancy it correlates with the establishment of a, a certain type of chromatin, right? Of acetylated chromatin. Now, uh, so these and, and a lot of other uh, experiments, including the fact that um, Actin and HNRMPU and PCAF can be co-precipitated together with the hyperphosphorylated form of POL2. And uh, um, if you disrupt uh, the actin HNRMPU interaction, also you abolish PCAF mediated uh, uh, HAT activity in vitro, at least, led us to postulate a model where, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Actin and HNRMPU are sitting at the promoter already, but they don't interact since the epitope uh, for the, um, uh, for, for in, in our chip experiments is, is uh, accessible at the promoter, but not accessible along the gene. They get together basically immediately after pro promoter clearance when they pro the CTD of the polymerase is already hyperphosphorylated in an RNA-dependent manner, since their distribution is RNA-dependent. And then they facilitate recruitment of PCAF. And PCAF, basically, once it's recruited, then it acetylates its target, H3K9, and establishes a permissive chromatin for the elongating polymerase, so that the polymerase basically can scan and pass through the nucleosome barrier, facilitating, therefore, its processivity. Now, the question that has been puzzling us is why can't uh, uh, a actin and HNRMPU interact at the, at the gene promoter? They can only interact uh, immediately after. And, and one of the reasons, one of, of course, keeping in mind that actin is a very sensitive protein, I mean, one of the reasons is that there may be changes in nuclear actin polymerization, right? It may, may go undergoes conformational changes, starts polymerizing, and therefore HNRMPU may interact. So then, of course, we were very intrigued by this possibility, and then we set out to, um, to have, uh, um, to, um, yeah. Now, this is, I, I'm not saying something entirely new, because other people have identified in the cell nucleus uh, uh, several actin-regulating proteins, like, for instance, NWASP, the, uh, the um, actin nucleating protein, uh, uh, I mean, um, yeah, F actin nucleating protein, or even uh, the ARP2 complex, which branches actin filaments. And surprisingly enough, uh, these proteins are both, uh, have been shown to be both implicated in transcription elongation, so elongation of nascent RNA transcripts. These were two important papers in Nature Cell Biology and, and JBC. Now, following these two papers, actually, uh, Nuri Hernandez, uh, who actually is the person who discovered that actin is coupled to RNA polymerase 3, came up with this uh, um, cartoon that was published in a News and Views article in Nature Cell Biology. And then she proposed that perhaps what happens is that at the promoter, you have more monomeric actin, whereas uh, along the gene, you have more polymeric actin. So you're basically implying that maybe some kind of uh, dynamic uh, actin polymerization along the gene. So, of course, this was very intriguing, and, uh, but when you discuss about actin polymerization, there are so many factors that are involved that I'm really not aware of. But certainly what I'm aware of is that there are, when, when you polymerize actin, right, you, you need uh, to have uh, a, a degree of F-actin severing yeah, in order to replenish the, 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 the pool of, of monomeric actin, right? And this is often done by a very interesting protein, which is called cofilin. 
So what we actually targeted cofilin uh, for this reason, because we wanted to see whether cofilin is implicated in transcription regulation, but also because we, we did, uh, in 2009, we did, we, uh, I, I did a, a short sabbatical in Singapore, and we did a, a, a massive mass spec analysis coupled to you know, this SILAC method, where you label uh, proteins, and, and then we found that actually cofilin-1 is part of the nuclear actin proteome. So that was very intriguing for us. So, so then we, we targeted cofilin, as I said, and we wanted to test whether it's implicated in transcription regulation, presumably by targeting the uh, transcription competent actin. So the first thing we did, that, so then we, uh, we asked the question, is, is cofilin associated with the transcription machinery? Is cofilin along the gene? And what happens if you silence cofilin to uh, transcription? Now, to test whether cofilin uh, is associated with the transcription machine is not that easy task, I must say. But, uh, but anyway, so what we, do, what we do is we isolate, we make nuclear extracts from mammalian cells and subject them to, uh, we fractionate these extracts. And when we analyze the fractions, we actually confirmed that actin co eludes with the phosphorylated form of the CTD, something that we published before. But cofilin was found at the bottom, uh, I mean, in the soluble fractions, it was far from co eluting <coughs> with, with the two. Uh, proteins of interest. Then what we do is, we did was to subject uh, uh, living, living uh, HeLa cells with uh, DSP. DSP is, is actually a short version for DTO succinimidyl propionate, which is a short range cross-linker. So it's 11 angstrom. So it cross-links proteins which are very close to each other, right? And it's cell permeable and also cleav um, thiol cleavable. Okay, so then we, we, uh, yeah, we, we make nuclear extracts and then analyze by gel filtration chromatography. What happens is that under these conditions, we shift a fraction of, uh, of uh, cofilin to the 2 to 3 megadalton kind of apparent molecular complex that contains actin and pol2. That doesn't mean anything, right? So to test whether these are real interactions, what we do is we take these fractions and subject them to IPs with uh, antibodies to cofilin antibodies to actin and antibodies to the uh, phosphorylated form of the polymerase. And, uh, and again, to cut a long story short, actin antibodies precipitated both uh, POL2-CTD as, uh, as expected and cofilin under conditions where the proteins are cross-linked, whereas cofilin-1 and POL2 precipitated only uh, actin, even in the presence of 8-molar urea, so that we guard against non-specific uh, cross-links. So then we came up with this idea, uh, at the moment rather preliminary, saying that cofilin is part of this complex, presumably transiently, because you need to cross-link uh, cells, uh, living cells, right? But they interact, probably cofilin there, it interacts with actin rather than the polymerase itself. Okay, so if this is true, then, I mean, you expect that cofilin-1 is also along the genes, along the gene along active genes. So we did chromatin immunoprecipitation. We do chromatin immunoprecipitation on this model gene because th this is the EP300 gene. Uh, it's big, 31 exons, so you, you, know, you, can, you get a kind of reasonable resolution for, for your chips. You, know, you can walk along the gene. Of course, we also, walk, we also test the promoter, UTRs and flanking regions. And we use antibodies against cofilin-1, actin, HNR, MPU, PCAF, and POL2, and so on and so forth. And we mark also acetylated histone H3. And then what happens is, again, to cut a long story short, cofilin, the occupancy of cofilin, uh, so we see that cofilin actually occupies exons, both uh, uh, promoter uh, proximal and promoter distal exons, as you can see here, and it follows actually, oc the occupancy correlates with POL2, this antibody H5 goes against the phosphorylated CTD, uh, but it's actually devoid from uh, from the regions which are outside the, the region, the, the gene, and uh, only marginally pres present at the, at the promoter. Okay, so now, so it is along the gene, uh, especially exonic regions. So if this is the case, does it, uh, is it implicated in transcription regulation at all? So what we do here, we silence cofilin-1 in HeLa cells, and then perform a run-on assay to monitor transcription. In this case, we use FURD. FURD is fluorine, uh, UTP analog, which is cell permeable. So that's actually very nice because then you can perform these assays kind of in living cells. 
So the incorporation is you just give it to the cell medium and it, you know, you'd wait uh, 20 minutes. It's not such a big uh, deal. If you want to monitor only poll one transcription, you just give it for five, eight minutes. Anyway, so what happens is here, here you see, and then of course we look at biconfocal microscopy. So what happens is that we have an abundant uh, localized presence of cofilin in the cell nucleus, and then it's of course present in the leading edge of the cell. And this is how the FURD incorporation looks by, you know, with an antibody which is commercially available. But if you silence cofilin, then you have a considerable decrease in, uh, in, uh, in the FURD incorporation. Now what happens also is, we, this is known, not from us, if uh, you silence cofilin, you also um, um, affect the, uh, the ratio between uh, G and F actin, right, at the cellular level. So, so then uh, what we test, what we wanted to do is we, test, uh, we wanted to test whether under these conditions there is uh, also the appearance of F actin in the cell nucleus, okay? And, uh, and we do that by so silencing and then phalloidin staining, which is marker for F actin. Then that what happens is here in the control cells, uh, you see that there are the F actin uh, structures, which are nice and, 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 and clear as they should be. But if you silence cofidin, you, have, you see you have an abnormal cytoskeleton, but also you have the appearance of these foci in the nucleus. So here you have a, a magnification of this picture. This is actually one of the optical sections of the confocal image where you can really see that there, is, there are these uh, foci, or also they are known as studs in the literature, F actin studs, which are known also to appear under conditions of stress in the cell. I mean, so this, this is not even entirely knew the appearance of F actin studs. Okay, so, but in this case, of course, what it means is that uh, cofidin 1 is required for transcription here, transcription elongation, because this assay supports the elongation phase, not the initiation phase, because FURD is added only to the nascent transcript and actually is probably cor correlating with the formation of F actin, abnormal F actin in the, in the nucleus. So then, uh, based on this, we tested whether what happens if you to, to gene occupancy of cofilin if you treat cells uh, with uh, actin targeting to toxins. No, that yeah, la trunculine A, cytokelesin D, and just plaquinolide. And this is what happens actually if you treat in particular. I'm not going to go in super in, into, into the details of this. If anybody's interested after. But uh, if you treat uh, with uh, toxins like latrunculin A and just plaquinolide, which ultimately, even though they act uh, with, through different mechanisms on, 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 uh, on actin, they lead to the depletion of G-actin from, from the cell. What happens is that uh, the, G, the exons are devoid of the polymerase actin and uh, cofilin. There's a major reduction in H3K9 acetylation levels. Whereas if you, if you uh, uh, on the other hand, if you treat with just plaquinolide, you stall everything, the machinery, in the uh, proximal exons. So you abolish. Whereas if you treat with cytokelesin D, then you don't see any, any changes. So this to say that, uh, and this is a quantification of the data, but this to say that actually occupancy of the polymerase and cofilin, as well as actin, actually depends on the polymerization state of actin. Uh, so then uh, we test, we silenced again cofilin 1 uh, again and, and performed CHIP and here I mean we really found that if you silenced cofilin then uh, you, the, the, the exons are devoid indeed of, poly, of the polymerase machinery and actin and there is a massive reduction also in H3K9 acetylation levels which is consistent with a block in, in uh, uh, with a transcriptional block. And, uh, and, it's, and it's an effect that you would get also if you treat cells with actinomycin D. So, so to conclude this study, which is uh, now uh, uh, in, in press, the, 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 uh, so cofilin 1 is part of the same complex with active POL2 and actin. It uh, cofi silencing of cofilin 1 inhibits transcription and so on. Uh, it selectively occupies gene coding region. And we think that cofilin 1 facilitates uh, occupancy of the phosphorylated RNA polymerase, so the machinery, the whole machinery. So we have this working model here. If we, we want to put everything into context. As I mentioned before, uh, actin and HNRMP and, and HNRMPU are already, are already sitting at promoter. They don't interact. They, they interact only after promoter clearance when the full CTD is phosphorylated. They interact, they recruit uh, PCAF. PCAF recruitment leads 
which is also RNA dependent, uh, leads to, uh, uh, to H3K9 acetylation. But concomitantly with this initial phase, we start having actin polymerization. That's what we speculate here, based on, on the presence of coffee. And this actin polymerization is actually controlled by, uh, by cofilin 1, the F actin severing uh, activity of cofilin 1, which actually is throughout the entire gene, because cofilin 1 is not found outside the gene, the active gene. OK, so all these. Uh, presumably to facilitate the processivity of the elongating polymerase. Okay, so this is of course a working model, right? And, and the only way, so the, the approach we are following here is to um, search for actin binding proteins, nuclear actin binding proteins. We have a massive list now uh, which has been identified by mass spectrometer. And so we try to dissect it from this point of view. OK, so let me move on to the second part, to another uh, project that we are running in my lab. So RMP assembly, how why actin is actually incorporated in the mature RMP. Uh, so again, uh, I'm, I'm, being a biochemist, I was really interested in searching for uh, actin-associated H and RMP proteins, right? So a few years, some years ago now, uh, so what we did was to isolate the 4TS pre-MRMP, MRMP fraction from rat liver extra, which is a classical way of doing it, I mean, uh, uh, biochemically. And then uh, we, we, subje we actually subjected this material to DNAs1 affinity chromatography. Why DNAs1? Because DNAs1 uh, binds acting very, very tightly. Don't ask me the, the reason, because I don't know. People don't know. But the amazing thing is that this is an anomolar type of uh, affinity, so you know, antibody antigen type. And, uh, and, and uh, so, so we, we and, and then when we did that, we pulled down actin from the RMP, of course, and a number of AB type H and RMP proteins. So AB type, you know, two RNA binding domain and, and an auxiliary domain, which is important for protein-protein interactions. So, but there was also this protein, CBFA, carg box binding factor. So we characterized this protein. It turns out that this protein actually is a genuine, again, AB type HNRMP protein. Uh, so what we did uh, to test that possibility is we performed UV cross-linking on, 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 uh, on, on living cells, and then we, uh, we, uh, we do um, oligo dt cephalos to pull down poly A mRNA, so mature mRNA, and then we analyzed, we analyzed by Western blotting if uh, the, our protein of interest is precipitated with this material. And it turns out that CBFA interacts wi with uh, poly-A mRNA both in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. Then we also found that CBFA is another actin-binding HNRMP protein, uh, and as revealed by protein, uh, even in vivo, uh, as revealed by in vivo protein-protein cross-linking. So it binds to actin both in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. And it shut off. So uh, we were, were very intrigued. And at, at that time, we started this quite risky project. So we, we basically, HNRMP proteins are, are important. Uh, this is a recent review from, from uh, Bob Singer. So HNRMP a, a proteins of the AB type bind uh, to, to nascent RNA right, to facilitate RMP assembly, right, co-transcriptionally. But current view is also that they bind co-transcriptionally cis-acting elements, which are located in the 3' prime UTR normally of the, of the transcript or even in the 5 prime UTR, sometime also within the coding region. And this is an important event because it leads to uh, the configuration of RMP, an, an event that occurs already a long time before the RMP is actually uh, performs its function in the cytoplasm. Okay, so why am I telling you that? Well, because of course we wanted to see whether CBFA binds any cis-acting elements uh, in the 3 prime UTR of the of the, of the nascent RNA and regulates the, the, the UTR. And, um, and in particular, uh, whether it binds cis-acting elements which are implicated in, 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 in cytoplasmic transport and localization. And as a model system here, we use, uh, yeah, all these two <laughs> basically. <laughs> so all these, uh, so as a model system we, here, we use uh, the myelin basic protein mRNA. It's well characterized. I mean, in oligodendrocytes, it's, no, it's known that MBP mRNA is transported from the cell body of the, of the oligodendrocyte all the way to the myelin compartment. And this event is actually important where it's locali localized and translated. And this is important for myelin biogenesis. So, but the interesting thing is that the MBP mRNA has this RNA, so-called uh, RNA trafficking sequence. It's a cis-acting element in the 3' UTR. 
and, uh, and this is important for its transport and localization. The mechanisms are not very clear, but it's, it's important for transport and localization. So we wanted to test whether CBFA binds to this sequence. Uh, so what we do is we, uh, bi we, we make biotinylated oligonucleotides and we couple them to streptavidin agarose beads and perform uh, affinity chromatography. So we, we, we incubate the beads with, uh, uh, so of course we have uh, the wild type RTS and then oligonucleo um, and then scrambled version of the RTS as control. And then, so then we have these beads, we incubate them with nuclear extracts, cytoplasmic extracts and cytoskeletal extracts. And then what we find <laughs> is the CBFA is co-precipitated with these uh, transcripts, uh, with these uh, oligonucleotides, rather specifically with the, with the wild type form. Is this a direct interaction? Yes, it turns out that it's a direct interaction because in EMSA experiments, actually uh, purified CBFA retards the electrophoretic mobility of these uh, oligonucleotides, which are now isotope, uh, you know, isotope labeled. Okay, so what does this mean? This is biochemistry, what does this mean? Now, what we did was to test, uh, first of all, whether CBFA is ubiquitously expressed in pro proliferating my mouse tissues. And what you see is that uh, it's kind of abundantly expressed in brain, testis, and so on. And um, so what we did uh, then, we looked at the brain, since, of course, oligodendrocytes are in the brain. Uh, so what we did was to test whether CBFA is present in oligodendrocytes in an in vivo, in, 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 in an in vivo context. So we, have, uh, we make sections of uh, adult mouse brain. And then uh, we, we, perf we perform, uh, we do immunofluorescence with our antibody against the CBFA. And what we've, with, uh, we co-stained the section with markers for oligodendrocytes, CMPAs in this case, and MBP, which is the myelin basic protein. And what you see here is that CBFA is expressed heavily in the cell nucleus, and it's uh, of, uh, of mature oligodendrocytes. You see that because you have these big uh, um, myelin plaques. Whereas in, in myelinating oligodendrocytes, uh, what happens is that you have uh, a, a distribution. The distribution is, is slightly different. You have uh, more of a granular distribution along the processes. Of course, here it's difficult to see, so I know that. <laughs> but so what we did was to perform immune electron microscopy on cultured oligodendrocytes and confirmed this thing. This is, this is actually the boring part, because <laughs> here we just confirmed that uh, CBFA is present in the nucleus. Yes, I mean, it goes, it's present in the processes, and it's also present in this myelin, in this uh, multilamellar structures, which are actually uh, myelin, or, or a, a reminiscent of the myelin sheath. The interesting, so, the interesting part is here, because what we did, when we stained uh, oligodendrocytes, cultured oligodendrocytes with our anti-CBFA antibody, performed immune electron microscopy and looked at the processes, you see these huge granules here, which are uh, stained, labeled with our anti-CBFA antibody. These are gold markers, uh, so to, just to specify. And they sit on these cytoskeletal structures. Now, this is very interesting because the mRNA, the myelin basic protein mRNA, and other uh, transcripts are transported in along to their final destination as large mRNA granules. And uh, in particular, the MBP mRNA granules are really big. They imagine that they have a diameter of approximately 400 nanometers, so they can be really seen uh, very well. And we think that these are gr RNA granules. Of course, uh, so, so to test whether this is the case, we performed uh, immunofish on, on cultured oligodendrocytes. <coughs> what we have here is our CBFA antibody, which uh, is abundantly expressed in the nucleus and gives these granular distributions in the, in the processes. This is just a magnification of a small part. And then this is the fish signal with an RNA probe against the RTS of, uh, of the MBP mRNA. What you see that if you merge the two channels, the confocal channels, then you see that there is a, a considerable correlation of the, of the signals, uh, suggesting, and this is a quantification, suggesting that they may sit, CBFA may sit in the granule. And in fact, even more so because CBFA precipitates MBP mRNA from, mouth, from brain tissue and also from oligodendrocytes. Okay. So what does this mean? Uh, so we have uh, CBFA, which is in the mRNA granule, presumably, presumably bound to the MBP mRNA via the A2RDRTS sequence. So we silence CBFA in, uh, in cultured oligodendrocytes, so the efficiency is not so bad. But uh, then what, and then we perform immunofish. And then what happens here is that if you silence CBFA, you have a specific accumulation of MBP mRNA as revealed by fish uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the cell body 
of, of oligodendrocytes, and it's, a, it's kind of excluded from, uh, from the processors, from, uh, so indicating that presumably the interaction between CBFA and the A2RERTS sequence in the mRNA granule is required to transport, the, transport it to the myelin compartment. Now, here, we, I can't tell you anything on the mechanism, but just, I mean, the, the only thing we, we proposed in this study that we published now a couple of years ago is that CBFA may be important, of course, to sort our, uh, trans transport competent RMPs. So that, then the, the question was left here. The, there are many questions, of course, which are open, and we are trying to, of course, address them. But one of them is, is, is this a general transacting factor? Uh, and, and then how, um, uh, uh, yeah because there are many transcripts that contain these uh, RTS sequences, including neurons. Inclu in, in, in okay, so that then what we wanted to do is test whether this is uh, a general observation. So since CBFA is expressed uh, in the brain, we tested, as I hinted, uh, whether it's expressed also in neurons. We, again, we, we have brain uh, sections of uh, adult mice. And what we see here, when we co-stain uh, CBFA with uh, the neuronal marker and, and, and NUN, is that CBFA is heavily expressed in the cell nucleus, similarly to oligodendrocytes. When we also uh, co-stain with synapsin-1, actually synapsin-1, antibody against synapsin-1, we see that uh, CBFA, actually the distribution of CBFA correlates yeah, with synapsin-1, which is a marker for synapsis, but th they don't overlap. Right? We have this type of correlation. And which is kind of schematically shown here. So, I uh, can't remember what is. Ah, yeah. So then we performed immune electron microscopy on brain sections now. And, uh, and so, and, when we, and we looked at the nucleus. And the, the nucleus, it's ve ve I mean, the distribution is really specific, remarkably <coughs> specific. Because what you see here is that CBFA is completely excluded from dense chromatin, okay? Which is the kind of, you can, that's uh, like mm, basically inactive chromatin. But, but, but it's actually labeling our antibody, the perichromatin region, which is at the border with, with, with the dense chromatin. Now, this is just a schematic diagram uh, where, where you have ongoing transcription, right? Where you have, basically, it labels uh, densities which are supposed to be um, pre-mRNAs, pre-mRNPs. It also labels densities in the interchromatin uh, uh, space, which is where you have all the mature particles, RNPs. And it also labels densities through passing through the nuclear pore complex. So suggesting that you know, we can correlate CBFA, presumably, with a, a, a active transcription or, or, or nascent RMPs. So then uh, we looked at the cytoplasm. In, in hippocampal neurons, so what happens is that CBFA is also present. Uh, it gives this granular distribution in dendrites, okay, reminiscent uh, of transported mRNA granules. And uh, when we co-stain the hippocampal neurons also with, uh, with uh, synapsin-1 markers, so markers for, 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 for the synapsis, so synapsin-1 and uh, PSD95, we see that there is also a considerable correlation with PSD95, which is a marker for postsynaptic densities. Okay, so when we then performed the electron microscopy, these findings you know, on brain sections, these findings were conf confirmed. Uh, now you have uh, also the CBFA label axons, which are myelinated. And then here, at the end of the kind of terminals, you have uh, labeling both in the pre and in the post synaptic buttons. Th these, these are just several examples here of labeling. So, uh, so this actually kind of suggests that CBFA goes from gene all the way to presynaptic uh, uh, buttons where you have mRNA translation, right? So that's the key, that's the exciting things for us. This is one of the exciting things for us. Is, but can we really correlate with the mRNAs? So biochemically, we isolated uh, uh, synaptosomal particles from, brown, uh, from, uh, from adult mouse brains, and we found a CBFA. We confirmed the immunohistochemistry, found that CBFA is present in, 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 the, in, in purified synaptosomal fractions. And then we, we performed a RIP, so RNA immunoprecipitations, and found actually that CBFA precipitates three transcripts, BDNF, CAM kinase 2, and ARC, mRNA transcripts, which are actually dendritically transported. They're well-characterized transcripts which are dendritically transported, versus alpha-tubulin, whose translation actually is occurring immediately after export. It's not transported all the way to synapse. So this was, again, kind of exciting for us. And uh, so what we did, then we looked at the three prime UTRs of these transcripts and found that they contain uh, 
the CSAC, the RTS CSAC element, which is actually quite similar to the MBP RTS that I showed you before. So we performed an RNA affinity chromatography, so we, we biotinylated these oligonucleotides, coupled them to streptavidin beads, and incubated them with, uh, with extra brain extracts, and then found that CBFA is co-precipitated, just like H and RMPA2, okay, specifically. And CBFA actually binds directly to these uh, oligonucleotides, in fact, uh, in EMSA experiments, as you can see here. So our, 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 without going too much into the details, so basically we, that's, that's the type of configuration that we are after. We think the CBFA binds the 3' UTR of these transcripts, again, via the RTS sequence. Is this happening in the, uh, in the granule? Again, we performed the immunofission, hippocampal neurons, and then you see that this, this, uh, this is our uh, antibody, and these are dendritically transported. So probes against uh, these transcripts, and you see that there is nice correlation in, in the dendrites, indicating, again, that it's probably in the transported granules. Whether these are transported, they are dynamic, of course, uh, what to, to test whether these are dynamic granules, we performed uh, uh, live cell microscopy on, uh, on uh, hippocampal neurons which are expressing EGFP CBFA and uh, when we looked at, um, at these granules, G G uh, CBFA rich granules at the termini of these dendrites, then uh, we, we saw that they actually move anterogradely and retrogradely, which is typical of transported mRNA granules. And, uh, and that these are RNA, RNA granules, we confirmed it because uh, this, uh, they, they correlate nicely with the fish signal from uh, our yeah, transcripts. Okay, so, uh, so of course uh, this means that again in, the, in this mRNA granules, CBFA binds the A2-RERTS sequence and then follows them all the way to synaptic sites where translation takes place. So then here what we did was to address whether all these events are uh, activity dependent. Since we are going to synapses, is this activity dependent? <laughs> so to test this, uh, what we did was isolated hippocampal neurons and uh, subject, uh, um, activated postsynaptic post receptors with NMDA or AMPA, which are classical reagents that are commercially available. And then we evaluated the levels of uh, CBFA in the dendrites. And qualitatively, already by immunofluorescence, you see that there is an increase in the dendrites of CBFA in the presence of the agonist, but not in the presence of the corresponding agonist. And when we quantitate this, this data, then we have that there is a two to threefold increase in the amount of CBFA in the dendrites, indicating that it's uh, in the presence of uh, stimulation, specific stimulation. So indicating that this is uh, uh, dependent on, on, on postsynaptic receptor activity. What about the mRNA? Well, we did the same thing, and then we evaluated by um, QRT-PCR the levels of uh, dendritic mRNAs, ARC, CAM, and BDNF. And you see, you see that we have a significant increase of uh, the, glob the levels of uh, mRNA upon synaptic stimulation. And this actually nicely correlates also in terms of significance with... Uh, the, uh, with, uh, with the binding of, uh, to CBFA. So you have increased the CBFA association in the presence of synaptic stimulation. So, uh, uh, so, so to summarize what I've shown you so far is, uh, so uh, CBFA is expressed in neurons quite ubiquitously, binds these transcripts through the transport, uh, transport elements and uh, localizes to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, 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 I mean, it's in these granules in an activity dependent manner. So at the moment, this is uh, our working model. Uh, this study is actually under final revision, hopefully. Uh, so this, uh, so what we have here, we think the CBFA binds to the A2RE RTS sequence co-transcriptionally and uh, facilitates the formation of the RMP already in the nucleus. And then the RMP is actually exported uh, assembles into these very large mRNA granules that are going to be transported on the cytoskeletal structures. This is actually adapted from uh, a review in cell by Anne Frussi. But, uh, uh, but what is very important here to remember is that this, uh, the CBFA binds specifically only transcripts which contain this A2RERTS sequence and not, for instance, tubulin, which does not contain it. So de facto, this provides a mechanism to configure the RMP already uh, you know, at the very early stage in the nucleus for cytoplasmic function, in, in particular transport and localization. So we think uh, that actually we, uh, again, I, I, this is our hypothesis and we are testing it uh, in the lab uh, that, uh, that CBFA actually cooperates at this stage with, with actin. They synergize for the remodeling of the 3' UTR 
of the nation transcript. Last 10 minutes, I promise. <laughs> Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit more about uh, ribosomal RNA biogenesis. What we found, what work that we have done over the past years to show how actin synergizes with nuclear myosin 1. So first of all, nuclear myosin 1, what's the difference between nuclear myosin 1 and the canonical form? The, the pres the in, in NM1, there is just uh, this extra peptide here in the N-terminus, which is uh, imparting kind of, is some kind of nuclear localization. But, but, but we don't know whether it's what it does really, because it doesn't look like an NLS. But the point here is, so when, when this was discovered by Primal de Lanerol in Chicago, so we raised a peptide-specific antibody against, uh, to monitor NM1, of course, working on actin in RMP, <laughs> we were particularly excited. Uh, and so we tested this, we characterized this uh, antibody on, uh, on uh, HeLa cells, the distribution, and of course we confirmed the fact that it's nucleoplasmic, but there were all these dots here in, the, in nucleoli. This is a very talented uh, French postdoc who was there in the lab. And, uh, and then, I mean, uh, these are reminiscences of transcription sites, I mean, of course. And, and then if, uh, in fact, if you perform a mirror electron microscopy, which perhaps you cannot see uh, properly, but anyway, the, the, the gold markers are sitting in the dense fibrillar component and fibrillar centers, which is where ribosomal RNA genes are synthesized. Now, in fact, uh, to cut a long story short, I mean, uh, if you perform uh, uh, run on assay using BRUTP under conditions where you uh, follow the incorporation into nucleoli, you see that uh, nucleolar NM1, you can see here the insets, co-localizes very nicely with, uh, with the nation transcript, both in interface and late mitotic cells. So in this study, actually, we showed for the first time that actin and NM1 associate with, with a large subunit of the polymerase, so POL1 and the interaction is important for, for POL1 transcription. So uh, then came a study, also because both actin and NM1 are sitting in iso on isolated nucleoli, right? These are isolated nucleoli. Th anyway, then came a study by Ingrid Grunt, who is the guru, I guess, of ribosomal RNA biogenesis, and then uh, uh, biochemically, and she, she biochemically proved that actin and NM1 are sitting at the promoter by chromatin immunoprecipitation. And then came a model where the, she postulated that uh, they may facilitate assembly of the Pol, Pol1 complex, right? Transcription competent Pol1. We didn't agree with this model. We, we thought that there was more of a function along the gene. Uh, and uh, so we did, uh, we isolated, we purified the cellular NM1 through a number of chromatography approaches. And when we, uh, uh, analyze the fractions from this gel filtration chromatography, we found that NM1 coelutes with the two core subunits of a chromatin remodeling complex will, uh, containing the Williams syndrome transcription factor and the ATPase SNF2H. This turns out to be a novel chromatin remodeling complex because these core components can be co-precipitated. Now we know a lot about this complex that we term b uh, Its assembly is transcription and RNA is dependent. It contains ribosomal RNA processing factors and associates with chromatin. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this because we published it a few years ago. But we found, basically, to summarize, that nuclear myosin NM1 is a core component of this BWH complex and that the BWH complex is required for activation and maintenance of productive Pol1 transcription through a, a, and, and this occurs through a chromatin remodeling-based mechanism. Okay, so then we came up with this model here that we published a few years ago in Current Opinion in Cell Biology, where, I mean, it's of course possible that actin and NM1 cooperate at an early stage uh, uh, to recruit POL1 as the promoter, but we think that the dynamic interaction between actin and NM1 is again required for the elongation, right, to rec re actually required to recruit uh, chromatin remodeling activity for the, uh, to, to provide permissive chromatin for, elong for the elongating POL1. So, now, this model has been extended in a recent review. Uh, so we came up with these two possibilities. Uh, one is because, of course, there is evidence that actin polymerizes. One possibility is that NM1 and actin cooperate here. Uh, on one side, NM1 can interact with the chromatin and pull the polymerase uh, along the gene. Uh, but the other alternative, which we kind of favor, is that NM1 interacts with the RNA with the nascent RNA, and that has a dual function because it can recruit chromatin remodeling activity on the gene while pulling the polymerase towards the end of the gene. So functioning, in fact, as a processive, almost a processive motor. So 
And this is, uh, we favor this model because uh, if you perform RNA treatment on living cells, the distribution of NM1 in the cell nucleus is released. So suggesting that NM1 really is associated with nascent transcripts. So, uh, I am, so the last few slides, as I said, I promise. <laughs> What was intriguing is a few years ago we discovered that BWitch contains the uh, precursor ribosomal RNA transcripts. So, so we had this crazy idea. Is it possible then? Yes, that NM1 is important for the nascent to, to, for the, you know, nascent, uh, to synthesize nascent pre-ribosomal RNA, but remains uh, associated with these things you know, during processing, maturation of the transcripts, incorporation into the ribosomal subunits. So two, um, and this is not entirely, I mean, uh, out of the blue because it's well known that during ribosomal RNA biogenesis, many non-ribosomal proteins are associated dynamically and disassociated dynamically with, with the transcripts, like for instance, export factors for ribosomal subunits. So, so we tested, so we isolated transcriptionally active uh, nucleoli and uh, made the nucleolar extracts from here and then uh, purified uh, by fractionation the pre-60s and pre-40s subunits and then analyze the fractions for, uh, for NM1. And you see that NM1 coelutes in an RNA-dependent manner with the big peak, which is the pre-60s subunits, and partly also with the pre-40s. Okay, so then uh, we tested whether it binds ribosomal RNA transcripts, uh, precursors, and mature transcripts. Here what we do is we, have, uh, we perform an actinomycin D course a pulse chase um, under conditions that block pol one transcription but do not affect processing, then isolate nuclei, and then IP with our anti-NM1 antibody. And what happens is that NM1 in the initial points of the time course precipitates the, the precursor transcripts, whereas in the final points of the time course precipitates the mature transcripts, so suggesting that this is an independent association. Okay, so that, that's the first thing. And this is consistent with their presence, the presence of NM1 in pre-ribosomal subunits. So then we, we wanted to know why is this happening. And we set up a, a novel assay, which is based on our, um, I don't know, I run on assays on, on isolated nuclei. So what we do is we block pol one transcription specifically, but not processing. Then we isolate nuclei, permeabilize mildly and add NM1, actin, and antibodies, and an antibody against DDX21, which is an RNA helicase involved in pre-ribosomal RNA processing. And then we evaluate the ribosomal RNA species. And just to bear with, if you bear with me, what happens here is that we have, uh, in all three cases, we have a stabilization of a very important precursor, which is called, uh, which, as you can see, is not processed anymore through the time course. And this is a very important precursor because it leads to maturation of the pre-ribosomal of the large pre-ribosomal subunit. Okay, so does this happen in, in living cells? Uh, so what, so, and, and eventually actin and, my, and NM1, do they synergize? And uh, to do that, of course, we can't silence these proteins, as, as you realize. Uh, so we treat with toxins. BDM blocks the ATPase activity of myosin, and these are, of course, the normal actin drugs. And again, if you treat with BDM, block the ATPase activity of myosin, you have an accumulation of 36 pre-ribosomal RNA, or even if you deplete uh, G-actin, okay? Suggesting that they must synergize, okay? It's important also that I point out that actin was found in ribosomal subunits already in 2007. It was a Nature Methods paper by the laboratory of Michael Rout, okay? This so makes sense. So then the question we addressed was, is, is this... Uh, a peculiarity of nucleolo, nucleolus, or da, do, and, uh, does NM1 follow the pre-ribosomal subunits all the way to the nuclear envelope, to pores in particular? So we performed field emission scanning electron microscopy on isolated nuclear envelopes from xenopulsocytes and labeled them with our antibodies, or scanning, ele and scanning electron microscopy on intact nuclei from xenopulsocytes, and then we found that NM1 is sitting at the basket of the nuclear pore complex. So this type of configuration right there. Is this relevant for what I've told you so far, later or uh, earlier? So that is, is this uh, NM1 bound to ribosomal RNA? Uh, so then we set out uh, a biochemical assay, the biochemical assay that provides a kind of uh, spatial temporal framework that we call uh, RIRIP, for, uh, based, and it's based on successive RNA immunoprecipitations. Uh, so what we do here, we cross-link cells, then we isolate nuclei and then perform the first RIP, 
with antibodies against NM1, CRM1 and NUP153. CRM1 is the export receptor for ribosomal subunits loaded in the nucleolus. NUP153 is a marker for the basket and it's the only RNA binding pro uh, nucleoporin component of the basket. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, yeah, so this is how it looks, the first trip, and then we evaluate the ribosomal RNA, see that all three proteins co-precipitate 18S and 28S ribosomal RNA. Then uh, we elute the material, which is precipitated, and subject it to a, se a second trip. So for instance, in the case of NM1, we elute the material and then precipitate it with CRM1 antibodies or NUP153. And you can see that both antibodies precipitate the same NM1 precipitated transcripts. So I'm not going to go further into details, but this basically suggests that NM1, CRM1, they sit on the same transcript. NM1 and uh, NUP153 sit on the same transcript at the basket, supporting the view that NM1 is added there and follows the RMP, the, the, the ribosomal um, subunit all the way to the basket of the NPC. Okay, so then uh, I this is my last slide. Okay, this, uh, that's the summary, what uh, I've just told you, basically. So we have, again, our, more, our working model. So we think that after they, they function in, uh, in pol one transcription elongation, actin and NM1 are incorporated in the SSU processosome or non-TS pre-ribosome and follow the transcripts uh, during processing into pre-ribosomal pre subunits and follow the pre-ribosomal subunits all the way to the basket and we think that uh, they synergize to facilitate, for instance, recruitment of uh, non-ribosomal proteins which are involved uh, in, uh, in, in the processing of, of transcripts, like, for instance, RNA helicases, which are essential. Uh, okay, so, um, yeah, that's my last slide. <laughs> and uh, to set basically facilitate the establishment of export-competent subunits. Yeah, and this is the people who have done the work. <laughs> so... Yeah, in particular, Alesh, who is a form, the, my first PhD student who graduated in, uh, in May and has done a lot of the work on actin, HNRNPU in uh, <coughs> mRNA synthesis and so on, and, and the cofilin story. Raju is a, my Indian PhD student who is graduating now in May and is now going for, looking for a postdoc. And he has done the, CBF, the work on CBFA. And then I, I acknowledge also Nanao, who is a postdoc, who is doing a lot of the work on, on spermatogenesis. Uh, yeah, and, and then uh, the people involved, of course. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>